It's always great bringing on someone like Avraham Gileadi, a scholar of Hebrew and the book of Isaiah, because I always learn something new. In this episode, we talk about the Book of Mormon and how it wraps around the Book of Isaiah, how Nephi's vision runs parallel and in front of some of the Isaiah chapters found in the Book of Mormon, how the Book of Mormon plays out just like Isaiah's prophecies play out, and how we today are in the same process, the same cycles, the same parallels of a civilization in decline and the great need for a Redeemer. Now, Avraham is also the founder of the Isaiah Institute. They've got a virtual conference coming up on March 30th, a day of reckoning. You want to learn more about Isaiah, about his prophecies, about how they apply to our day, then make sure that you click on the link here above on the card or the link in the description and register for the event. You can also go to IsaiahInstitute.com and click on the link for the day of reckoning there. I'll be watching. I hope you are too. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we bring back scholar Avraham Gileadi, who is an expert on Hebrew and on the book of Isaiah. We're going to go over the book of Isaiah. There's a few points we're going to cover. What is the real importance of of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. Why do you think Lehi and Nephi are so enamored with his words? How does Nephi use Isaiah in the Book of Mormon? And do you think that the Book of Mormon is written around Isaiah? And is Isaiah that primary inspiration? Uh, Avraham, welcome back to the program. It's great to be with you again, Greg. Always a pleasure. I'm excited to go over this. You know, it's, uh, and, and I know you obviously know this, this is what you dedicate yourself to, but Within the church, there is a massive void of knowledge about the book of Isaiah. Uh, I participate in that. I don't have enough of a knowledge of the book of Isaiah, but it's just odd to me. You know, I was thinking just this morning as I was preparing for this, um, you know, back in the 80s, President Benson gave a talk about how the church was under condemnation for not reading the Book of Mormon and reference scripture. I feel like we almost are at a point also where there's going to be something similar coming up about the book of Isaiah and going in and bringing up uh, the commandment in 3 Nephi 27, I think, of of the Savior saying this is a commandment that we search these things out, and we haven't done that yet. And and so it's just it's great to have you on here, and I hope that those that are listening can garner a greater understanding of the book of Isaiah and feel an inspiration to pursue the words in that book and to pursue an understanding. So um, let me start off with this. What is the real importance of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon? People go through the Book of Mormon. They see all these chapters in there. Most of us skip those chapters and just kind of move on to what we better understand. Why is there so much of the Book of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon? Right. And, and But I want to go back to your point about President Benson. In those days, sure. for a minute, um, President Benson understood Isaiah quite well, even though he wasn't a scholar either. But he had this intuitive and prophetic knowledge of it, of the importance of it. And in his days, in the days of Spencer W. Kimball, the next prophet of the church, um, there was this ex- exciting and intense interest in things like Isaiah and the Book of Mormon, and there were study groups, and there was a spirit of inquiry in the church. I remember it very clearly. And then uh, and then in the, in the 90, mid-90s, uh, the lid was put on that quite severely. And I think the church has not recovered from that. Um, and so today we're kind of lingering in a, in a twilight zone with... Isaiah and the Book of Mormon. And it's not just the Book of Mormon, but Isaiah is is indeed the, the whole heart and soul of the matter of the Book of Mormon and of the end time. And if people would understand that, <clears throat> I think they would have less of a reluctance not to not keep Jesus' commandment to search it diligently in, in 3 Nephi 23, but they would take it on. And if they could just take it on, what a difference that would make in their lives. Because with the doing comes the understanding, but without the doing and paying the price for it, 
the understanding cannot come. And now, I've, like you said, I've spent my life 40, 40 or 50 years on Isaiah. And that's post 10 years of postdoctoral work. And my doctoral thesis was, was on Isaiah. And Unobi was my chairman. And so the understanding that I've come to is quite different from other people's understanding of Isaiah. Because every time I would make a new literary discovery, it had I had totally had to revamp my whole thinking, previous thinking of Isaiah. And you know, Nephi and, and Jacob, Nephi himself, who had this amazing vision, which oh yeah, visions. No, he had this amazing vision all the way to the end time, and he saw our day. And so it totally affected him in what he wrote and what he chose to write about in the Book of Mormon. Knowing how hard it is to inscribe with a stylus one letter at a time into the middle. And then a third of the Book of Isaiah that way. I'm sure he had intentions to do more toward the end of his life, but near the end, I think he realized he couldn't do that. But what he was able to do at least was was to write some of the highlights of the book of, book of Isaiah. And as I've mentioned many times before, and others have latched onto this, that um, he wrote those things that would most benefit us and that he himself could not talk about. He's forbidden to write um, because it was for John the Revelator and, and people personally who would search Isaiah to come to the understanding of it because they must... End time people had to exercise faith, as the ancients did. And if they didn't care, didn't care to do it, then, well, that was on their heads. But he wrote what he did to try to communicate as much of what he saw in his vision that he could within, the, I guess, the short time that he had left in his life. Because he, he, he did apparently did it near the end of his life. And then he has that lament right after that in 35, 23. I mean, second Nephi 20, 23, 32, excuse me, getting dyslexic, um, where he's bewailing the fact that um, they will not search knowledge. They think they know of themselves, speaking of us. And so what is it that we need to be searching? They will not search knowledge. They're ignorant. They're, they're you know, they're, it's his last great lament. Read it and see what it says because it's, it's sorrowful. He's filled with deep sorrow for what he sees among us. So, yeah. Well, do you think that, that, that maybe there's a, you say there's a lid that was put on it in the nineties uh, of, of, I, I guess this inquisitive spirit uh, in the book of Isaiah. I think that there's kind of a, it, it's, People look at it and they don't understand it, right? They they don't get it, and that's the you know that's it, it's it's very super. An understanding is very superstitious, uh, 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 or superficial. It's it's very linear, if if at all anything, in terms of understanding what is being said there. Uh, people might see chapter fifty three and understand that a little bit. Um, you, I think you would say, well, I don't think they really understand. Most people don't really understand that. But I think that there is there's that duality, right? Of okay, well, yeah, maybe we are a little worried about people speculating on what Isaiah is trying to say because it's not just written out for us. And so there's a concern about that. But at the same time, if you don't move down that path, and and try and get through, you know, uncovering the veil, you know, pulling the veils back, so to speak, as you go through it. How are you ever going to understand it? This is the fine line people have to walk. And uh, actually, um, you know, the Lord gives no commandment save as He prepares a way, and He's commanded us to search Isaiah diligently, and that's what that's what it requires. Without that, you cannot do it, and it takes not just a week or a month or a year, it takes several years to get. But in the 1980s, I provided the literary tools. I mean, 
I was given help to discover these things. These, I, I discovered literary structures, layers of them that have their own meaning over and above what it says on the surface of, of Isaiah's prophecy. I discovered typologies, how 30 ancient events repeat themselves in that short brief window of the end time of about seven years or so. 30 events, think about it. 30 ancient events, major events that all repeat themselves like dominoes, boom, 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 within a short period of time. I discovered code names and keywords and word links. Word links tie the whole book of Isaiah together. It's why you cannot interpret one passage or one verse or one idea without connecting it to all the others. The only way that you can, the only way that I felt qualified to even write a book on Isaiah, which I've written many, with different literary approaches to Isaiah, to explaining those tools is after I spent 10 years of, of postdoctoral work. And then I felt qualified. Find but today you have all these Isaiah, overnight always Isaiah experts. And really there's a lot of being there's a lot being taught there that's just not not in Isaiah. If they knew in Isaiah, I'm sure they wouldn't do it, but they don't seem to care to know Isaiah that way. So yeah, um, I think the tools are there, and if anyone wants to tackle it, and I, I promise, and, and many have fulfilled this promise, that if you will even consider the tools that I have in one of my books, you'll see, whoa, there's way more here than I thought, and that is the common reaction. And then when I get into it, there's nothing more exciting than to discover it. It's like a, it's like a detective novel, getting into Isaiah, you know, figuring it all out like a jigsaw puzzle. And it's a beautiful experience when that happens. But just getting a, a horse, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's the key. You can't make him drink. And today there's this kind of a spiritual wokeism that's happened where you better toe our line or else we're going to come down on you, you know. <laughs> and so you you have it on both sides. You you have that on the one hand, and then you have the neglect that Isaiah has received with very with only very superficial comments on Isaiah, because no one dares to do it in case, like you say, they they might get it wrong, get it wrong, and then they're responsible for getting it wrong and causing people to be you know confused about Isaiah. Yeah. So you're when you say when you say a uh, uh, spiritual wokeism, you're talking about some type of uh, almost an academic elite narrative, so to speak. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's it's the same as in the Book of Mormon. That's why the Book of Mormon. Isaiah is such a key to the Book of Mormon. What would you say is the biggest, you know, chasm then between what you would say is kind of the academic narrative as compared to what you're trying to, what what, what you've discovered in Isaiah. And this reluctance, it's already they have preformed ideas. And they've carried those those narratives that are those precepts of men that have no scriptural basis for many, many years. And when somebody says, No, that's not what Isaiah says, that's not even in Isaiah, it's not even scriptural. And how you came up with that is because you didn't search Isaiah diligently. But then one quoted another and another, and pretty soon that's the common line, the gospel of the day, and it's not. But if you then say that it's not, but this is what it says, because they, they don't have the background of having done all the research and having paid the price for the knowledge of understanding Isaiah, then they'll come down on you and, and, and say, well, it's the same thing as going on in the political realm, Greg. You see, you see the, what's, the, how the woke crowd acts toward the others, to the, to the truthers, right? The truthers are now the, the bad guys. And they will not even consider what the truthers have to say. They're not interested in the truth. They have their own kind of a delusional idea of reality. Um, yeah, and so today you have, like Stalking Wolf said, you have the doers and you have the judges. <laughs> and the, and mm -hmm. the judges seem to be the ones having sway, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. then they accuse you of trying to lead people out of the church and things like that. No way. That's that's what the truth is. I mean, that's what the woke crowd does because they themselves do not put in the effort and do not are not willing to pay the price. They carry this guilt. This is how I look at it. Look at it. They carry this guilt, and the same in, in politics. 
and then they want to dump off their guilt on someone else because that relieves them of their feelings of guilt for, temporarily, right? <laughs> but then they they can never let go because they'll always be coming after somebody to find them the problem, not themselves. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's I know what you're saying. It's <laughs> nature, nature to do that, right? Yeah, no, I definitely know what you're saying. Everybody just repent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Let's back to the Book of Mormon here. So Nephi, for example, is has got, you know, he's bringing in Isaiah. He loves Isaiah. He wants to liken Isaiah to his circumstances, to his remnants, so to speak, his descendants. And and he has, though, first his this vision that is, you know, hey, let me learn more about my father's vision of the tree. And then it goes well beyond out into, you know, and maybe Lehi saw, saw more as well, but he goes well beyond where he's starting to see a lot about similar themes that Isaiah talks about, right? Where you've got these groups of, okay, well, there's the the Jews and there's the the Gentiles and there's these groups and, and big events that are coming in the future uh, and how those groups are going to work with each other. What is the dynamic there? How is this all part of the plan of God? And then beyond this vision that Nephi has, boom, he starts knocking in, you know, you know, a couple chapters here. He speaks a little bit more, and then he throws in, what is it, 10 or 14 chapters, I can't remember, of uh, Jacob comes in and inserts some, some Isaiah as well, and then, and then you get all these chapters of Isaiah uh, in 2 Nephi. How are these correlated? Is this is is what we're seeing in Nephi's vision with the angelic coast the same as what Isaiah has seen, but he's just got different language for it? Is it is Isaiah taking it beyond where where uh, where Nephi has has what he's seen in his vision, or do they just complement each other? Yeah, I I think you have to ask the question uh, about. A vision of the end from the beginning, and Isaiah says he had a vision of the end from the beginning, and he used to write it down as as a book for the end of time. It's very specific about that. But you know, the Lord showed Enoch the end from the beginning. He showed Moses the end from the beginning. He showed the brother of Jared the end from the beginning. He showed Moroni the end from the beginning, and so that's why Isaiah would say of the end time watchmen of the, that are going to be the watchers or the watchmen of the end time that they see eye to eye. They've all had the same end time vision, so there's no way you can persuade them otherwise from what they've seen, right? So having seen what he saw, I'm sure, he, and having the manner of the Jews in order to understand Isaiah in the first place, because I'm sure Isaiah was probably the one of the main things through which he learned the manner of the Jews back in Jerusalem when they were still there. Because he was learned, learned in all the manner of the Jews, he said. And he makes that a key of, for understanding the book of Isaiah. So anybody who hasn't done that or doesn't even understand what that is really should do that first. And they did that first. And I'm sure that Jacob, who's probably 20 years younger than Nephi, got a load of that from Nephi before he ever started, mm -hmm. you know, speaking himself, just like. Or take take the sons of Messiah before they ever went on their mission, right? They studied the word of God diligently for a long time. And only then, and fasted and prayed, before only then did they qualify, feel qualified to go out on a mission and talk about things. And of course, the same with Alma the Elder and Alma the Younger both. Um, so what Nephi, so first of all, I think we have to get a grasp that Nephi understood Isaiah before he ever started realizing how he could communicate things out of Isaiah. And, and when he saw it, as you said, you, you, you're hitting right on the right points each time, Greg, how what he saw and vision coincided with what he read in Isaiah and what he understood from Isaiah from the, from a long time ago even, right? And he, he, he makes the daring prediction that in the days that the prophecy of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, meaning the end time, he's speaking in 35, 25, 
about the man of the Jews and the spirit of prophecy about in the very hour or the very end time when when these things, events of Isaiah, these prophets are happening, that's people. Are, that's when people are going to understand them because he's seen that in vision. But there's still more. That we're still not getting at the, the big picture that Nephi and Jacob and eventually Mormon, Moroni, they're like, they're like bookends, right, to the Book of Mormon. Nephi and Jacob and Mormon and Moroni at the other end of the Book of Mormon, mm. saying the same thing, a second or third or fourth witness. They're speaking to us Gentiles. And what are they saying to us Gentiles? Not very great things. You've polluted the Holy Church of God. You are into, you are into this, that, and the other. And if you don't repent, the same thing is going to happen to you. Moroni is is hinting big time without actually coming out and condemning us, Gentiles, Ephraimite Gentiles, Ephraim who assimilated into the Gentiles, who's become known as the Gentiles in the Book of Mormon. Even in Joseph Smith's temple dedication of the, of the Kirtland Temple, us who are identified with the Gentiles, he recognized that. He's saying, what's happened to the Jaredites in so many words, he's saying, this is what happened to the Jaredites this is what's happened to the Nephites, and now this is what's going to happen to you, Gentiles, if you don't get your act together, which he knows they won't. Nephi knows they won't. And he too cannot come out outright and condemn us out of the things which he's seen in vision, but what he can say is just drop hints here and there between the lines, like in his conversation with Laman and Lemuel, you need not suppose that the Gentiles are utterly destroyed then. Whoa, you mean completely destroyed then? Well, yes, that's what he's implying. But his and Jacob's great hope for the Gentiles is that some of them will, you know, have care for the house of Israel. He, he uses those words and see whence their bless from whence their blessings have come. They've come from the house of Israel. Gentiles have no right to the covenant blessings of the house of Israel. It's only kind of on loan. But as, in as much as we have lineage of the, the house of Israel through through Ephraim, then and the birthright, you might say, because Ephraim is the birthright tribe, we have a great responsibility to perform toward the rest of the tribes of Israel, whom the Book of Mormon identifies always consistently as the Jews, the ten tribes, and Lamanites or Neph Lehi's descendants. So those are the house of Israel by definition. And we Ephraim my Gentiles are, by definition, called the Gentiles, or what's called the fullness of the Gentiles, a specific, ca specific category of Gentiles that has this birthright mission. And that is their great hope in that, in that remnant of Ephraim that will take on their birthright role and be a savior to their descendants because the gospel is going to switch from the Gentiles when the the iniquity, then their iniquity is full. And then it'll get as third Nephi, Jesus 16, 20, 21. When uh, sometime after the Gentiles have received the word of God, have received the fullness of his gospel, through, that's through the prophet Joseph Smith. Then when they harden their hearts against it, it turns to the house of Israel. And then the house of Israel goes empowered by God and cuts down the Gentiles and destroys them like the Lamanites destroy the Nephites. Yeah. Book of Mormon is full of types. If we, if, we, if we understood how Isaiah uses types and shadows in the past, we would understand exactly how the Book of Mormon writers use types and shadows in the past. To tell us all that less than a hundredth part of what they could have written in all these given instances, their criteria was Isaiah's criteria. Just include what's typological, guys, you know. This is a type for the end time. We see it. We saw it in vision. Let's put that in the Book of Mormon so that those living in the end time who are repeating that same scenario can understand how the Lord is acting and allowing that to happen in their day and what they can do about it, how to live. Isn't this important? I mean, <laughs> Isaiah is just a fantastic book. 
and the Book of Mormon is is just equally fantastic. You have uh, you've got a chapter in your book uh, Isaiah decoded where you it's called the past provides a sure pattern of the future, and uh, I you know I was contemplating that a bit because that's that's you know as you lay out several times and in different ways you know Isaiah is using the past to lay out the future uh, as he's talking about Assyria and Egypt and Babylon and. Israel, et cetera. Um, and so he's using what's happening in his time and, and in the past as a type for what will happen in the future. And that, the, the more you think about that, that is a really powerful message because, you know, one of, one of the phrases I, I say sometimes is truth is found in patterns. And so when you have patterns, <clears throat> you can recognize the truth easier. <clears throat> yes. So if you're falling, if, if we are, for example, in our time going through <clears throat> a similar pattern of what has already happened in the past, <clears throat> we can see what happens. And why would it be the same? Because human nature <clears throat> doesn't change. Yes. Right. Human nature is the same. And, <laughs> and unfortunately, with the law of numbers, when you get enough, there's there's the singularity that happens. But when you get enough people, it's unfortunately societies typically perform similar <clears throat> to others in similar circumstances. Yes, correct. And and so that it's almost like. A, <clears throat> it's, it's like a second witness <clears throat> and a third witness and a fourth witness as you see these these same you could go back to genesis and and cain and abel it's it's you know those stories are repeated over and over and over again throughout time and should give us a clear message of where we're going well you know when jesus gives that commandment to search isaiah diligently and i don't know how many people can check off that box but they should uh, he also gives one of the keys to understanding Isaiah, and that is all things that Isaiah spake have been and shall be. He spoke of all things, past his own day and, and, and further back and soon after his day, in the time of Cyrus and that, and, and the end time and the fullness of the gospel. It's all there in Isaiah, and it's, it's beautiful in Isaiah. And the Book of, Book of Mormon takes right off on that, just as I mentioned a minute ago. For example, you see in the, that, that Nephi covers their exodus out of Jerusalem <clears throat> in a lot of detail with um, Lehi, a prophet, being threatened with death and having to flee Jerusalem, but the Lord providing a promised land for him. They go into the wilderness, they flee Babylon, so to speak, they wander through the wilderness. All of this is what Isaiah is saying. Go out of Babylon in the new Exodus. Wander through the wilderness. There'll be water and there'll be food in the wilderness, as there was for them. And then they and then beyond, beyond the Book of Mormon account, there is also in Isaiah the conquest of the land, a new conquest of, of the land, like it is like it was under Joshua. That's one of the. These are the you know some of the main events that happened in Isaiah's. Before Isaiah is there, that Isaiah is saying will repeat themselves in the end time. But when you go further into the Book of Mormon, you see there's actually seven to ten exoduses of people um, of Nephi from the land of first inheritance to the land of Nephi. All those who are willing, all those who believe in the revelations of the Lord. Well, you know, Isaiah is part of the revelations, it's part of the Book of Mormon. And like you say, we're under condemnation for having treated all this lightly. Doctor and Kevin is telling us that. And the prophets have been telling us that. And there is King Mosiah's exodus out of the land of Nephi down to Zarahemla. There was Alma, the elders' exodus out of the land of Nephi to the land of Helam. There's their exodus from the land of Helam down to Zarahemla. There is King Limhi's exodus down to from the land of Nephi down to Zer there's the Jaredite exodus out of Babel or Babylon. 
the Tau Bay. It was the same word in Hebrew. Um, so when you put all these exoduses together side by side, they have things in common. And that creates an exodus pattern. And that exodus pattern is prophetic for the end time exodus that Isaiah predicts in his book, which the Book of Mormon takes on and talks about in those chapters from Isaiah that it quotes. I mean, you see how all this intertwines. And then in the second half of Alma, you have all these wars explained in great detail. What are they doing there? I mean, why don't they just give us the pure word of God? No, those wars are very important because they create a war pattern. And that war pattern is prophetic of the great war, the end time war, the war to end all wars, a third world war that, you know, that Isaiah talks about. After that, there'll be no more war. And, and that is, yeah, the worst kind of scenario. And this is what Nephi sees, and he's seen it, and Isaiah predicts it in those same chapters, chapters 10 through 14, that he's quoting in, in 2 Nephi 20 through 24. And, and, and those earlier chapters from chapter 2 through, third, through um, 9, they're all about the idolatry of God's end time people, like the idolatry and the injustice of the of his people, or the people in Isaiah's day, that are prophetic for the end time as well. And it's talking about us. But if you say those things, no one wants to believe it because they don't want to believe bad things about themselves. <laughs> so they'll they'll try to slay the messenger again, you know, human nature again. <laughs> so yeah. where do you go with this, Greg? That's that's interesting. So, for example, I mean, you know, you say you know, people don't want to hear that about themselves. When, you know, based on what you've uh, uh, outlined, um, graphed uh, in 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 the Book of Isaiah, um, you see America, the country of America, in the writings of Isaiah in a couple of different ways, and. So that's one way, at least those of us that are here in the United States um, can say, well, we don't want to hear this about ourselves. But the other way about that is it's also speaking about the church, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of the saints and, and uh, you know, are we staying on the right track? And, and he doesn't always have the best words for us there. But you can't say that. <laughs> you can't say that because then they'll accuse you of not following the prophet. And they're taking members out of the church by saying those things. P many people are leaving the church and it's your fault. No, it's not my fault. Because it's what Isaiah is saying. I'm not saying it. Isaiah is saying it. And, yeah, and I don't think it's just a matter of, of, of you know, whether you're following the prophet. It's a matter of uh, it's a matter of pride to me. It's a matter of, no, this isn't me. I'm I a is member of the church. I, I do this. I do this. I do this. Yes. And it's, you know, I've got this checklist, but it's, you know, everybody thinks that everybody thinks that they're doing the right thing. Everybody, you know, typically thinks that you've, you're, you're on the right track. And I think for the most part, I think we do have a, we, we are to a certain degree, a shining city on a hill. Um, but I think that the Lord has certain expectations and, and we may not meet those expectations. I mean, certainly, that's, for example, where's the rest of the Book of Mormon? That was, that's supposed to be revealed when we're ready for it. Where, where yes. is that? That's a sign well, that we, we we're not, not ready for it. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, and I was I was using their narrative of following the prophet. I, yeah, yeah. I I say I follow Jesus Christ. That is what I say, and that is what I seek to do day and night. Uh, and that's not I'm not following the prophet. I fo follow the prophet's counsel. He's counseled us through to seek for the Holy Ghost, and how important is that? Because that's the only thing you may have at some point if you haven't searched Isaiah or the Scriptures to know any different. That's the only thing you may have. But at the same time, there's a lot of precepts of men out there, as I mentioned, to which the Holy Ghost cannot bear testimony. You, the more truth you have, the more truth you figure out from Isaiah and from the Book of Mormon, from the Scriptures, then the Holy Ghost can test, then the Holy Ghost can work with you a whole lot better. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like insurance, life insurance, in a way. Oh, and back to your point about Egypt, um, Egypt was the great superpower of the day, in Isaiah's day. And the, and the other great superpower, well, a militaristic power rather, was Assyria, 
a militaristic power, militaristic power from the north that was the first to conquer the ancient world by military force. And it had an alliance of nations. I mean, look at the world today. We see that alliance forming today. We see that nation already at war, doing exactly what Isaiah said, encroaching upon other nations by degrees and cutting off some of their lands and incorporating them or trying to incorporate them into its empire. And it never lets up on that, by the way, until it's until that nation and that alliance is destroyed eventually after much grief for the whole for the entire world. But that is what the world that is what the world is, is coming to because people are basically, you know, not even thinking about repenting, not even thinking about maybe we got it wrong. Maybe maybe we're the ones that are the problem. No. And so the time comes when the iniquity of the world's inhabitants is full and the Lord brings on the judgment. And that is what Nephi saw. And isn't that something that we should be, you know, giving attention to and say, okay, if, if, if Isaiah saw our day and, and these literary structures, the ones I've discovered, uh, uh, transform the whole book of Isaiah into an end time scenario. And Book of Mormon writers, whenever they quote Isaiah, they are doing it in the context of the end time, not their own day, not the time of Joseph Smith, the very end time scenario, what Joseph Smith calls the, the winding up scene. Then, then those ancient nations, then the names of those ancient nations become code names for end time nations and people. So that indeed, Egypt, the great superpower of Isaiah's day is a code name for America. And Assyria is a code name for, I assume, the latter day alliance of northern nations that are um, already lining up, lining up to against Ukraine, against Israel, against the West, Western nations of Western Europe. You already see it happening. It's, it's beginning to shape up. And people in the past, of course, have thought it was shaping up. But look at the world today, what a mess it's in. And, and look how quickly it's going down the drain. Unless you have your head in the sand, you cannot miss it, what's going on in the world today and how corrupt and evil it is becoming. It's right in your face. It's everywhere. You look around in society, the murders, the obscenities, the abominations of people that they're proud of, you know? <laughs> so, so, Abraham, if we've got if we've got this message given to us, I mean, you know, it, 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 as you're saying that, what I'm thinking in my mind is, okay, so uh, Isaiah is speaking about these things. Isaiah saw the remnant of Joseph. Uh, he, he sees the last days. Um, he writes about these things. Uh, the Book of Mormon prophets are writing about these same things. And even though they know and they understand, they seem to understand Isaiah fairly well. And Nephi has a pretty good idea of what Isaiah is talking about. The people still fall into the exact same trap, right? They eventually fall to the point of destruction at the time of Christ's visit, and then uh, and, and then they do it again, and and they end up, you know, going into the secret combinations, going into ites, and they fall apart, right? Civil war, everything, and they and they fall. The civilization falls apart, even though. At the core of all their writings here, they've got these writings of Isaiah and Nephi and others that are saying the exact same thing, that this is what is going to happen, that you're going to fall through this. Well, we think in our minds, and and I, and maybe, I think I think this, right, is, well, then the Book of Mormon from that point gets transferred by burial and angelic revelation to Joseph Smith, and we end up with it in our time so that we have this record combined going back through Isaiah, up through the Book of Mormon, to show us, hey, this is what's going to happen. Watch out and, you know, study these things diligently, search them diligently. And you're saying that regardless of all that, we are also going to fall into the same trap. Is this not a re isn't the Book of Mormon something that we can use to gather Israel and make it so that so that it doesn't happen again this time around 
No, it's it's going to happen. They saw it in vision. Isaiah saw it in vision. And some say, well, you know, um, well, Nineveh didn't need to fall. The people repented, so it didn't need to happen. The Lord changed his mind. No, whatever is written happens. The word of, It happened later, several hundred years later in the time of, maybe not several hundred, but later on, the time of Tobit, Tobias. It's in, it's in the Catholic canon that it happened. The Lord, yes, people can forestall the fulfillment of prophecy for a time. But no, it's so clear. Only they cannot condemn us and say outright, this is going to happen to you. That's not their prerogative to do so, right? That would be hypocritical and condescending and, and condemning and so forth. No, the, Jesus can do it. He does it in Third Nephi. Read Third Nephi, what he says about the Gentiles and house of Israel there. But they can hope and they, and, he, they, and Nephi predicts, you know, in Third Nephi 13, 14, there'll be a great and marvelous work happen. On the one hand and on the other, it's everlasting on the one hand and on the other, among the Gentiles. And they're going to go one way, and that is to harden their hearts, or they're going to go the other way and repent. Repent of what? We're members of the church. Yeah, repent of your idolatries, repent of your addictions, your materialism, your... <laughs> if you understood what there is to repent of, I think you might get right on your knees and start repenting. But you're spiritually blind, so you don't even see what you need to repent of. You know, that is the big one in Isaiah. The people are spiritually blind because of their materialism, because of their idolatries. So they can't even see the real situation. Their spirituality has morphed from what it used to be into this superficial thing where, um, you know, the words of Isaiah, are, oh yeah, they're great. Jesus says they're great. Well, this is great, that's great, everything is great. Well, that's a cliche in English. No, the words of Isaiah were truly great. They were many layered to show how God's truth is many layered. And when you come to one layer and internalize it and live it, then there's another layer, layer waiting for you to internalize and live it. And another and another. And, and so you can never say, well, I know all about it. Or I already know, as many say. Because the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> so you become God, then you can know all things. Um, so what what do you see? What do you see as the role or or the outcome of the church gathering Israel in this time as things begin to percolate here um, for the last days? What what does Isaiah have to say about the church separate from America, separate from Egypt, so to speak? Because this is kind of the gathering place for, well, for well, Israel is in one in one one manner, right? Spiritually and probably physically, I think. And then of course you've got Israel also as a gathering place. But what what is what's the cha what's the this change there? Because we are part of this culture. We are, you yeah. know, to to kind of put your your uh, uh, duality in place. We're we are Egyptians, <laughs> right? Right. So to speak, we're Joseph in Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so, so we are. We're going to be and act like Egyptians to some degree. Yes. Unless we carve ourselves out. Yes. Right. Yes. We. So we have this duality. Indeed, we do. And one of them is that we are we belong to the nation of Egypt so to speak, end time Egypt, the code name of, for, for American. Mm -hmm. And when you read chapter 19, go to chapter 19 and chapters 30 and 31, read all about America right there. It fits to a T, especially now with the po political scene. And so since Egypt is becoming a more and more a wicked nation and, a, and an idolatrous nation, we do partake of the collective guilt of the nation. And when the Lord decides to punish Egypt, by the invading Assyrians uh, from both sides of the of the of the land, then um, <clears throat> then we are faced with the punishments of the, due from the collective guilt of the nation as a whole. The other Gentiles, the non-LDS Gentiles, that are not Ephraimite Gentiles necessarily, 
That's why we call the fullness of the Gentiles or the consummation of the Gentiles in Jacob's blessing of Ephraim on Ephraim's head. And in, in Nephi's writings where the gospel is restored to the Gentiles and goes to the house of Israel from the, through the fullness of the Gentiles. That expression relates directly to Ephraim and Jesus uses it also in third Nephi. At the same time, when you superimpose the book of Isaiah on the end time and see the history of Isaiah's day as an allegory of our day, of the end time, then those early chapters that Nephi includes in the Book of Mormon, chapters 2 through 9, that, that describe the idolatry of the people, that's all about us. Go into it and see all our sins are, are delineated right there. And those are the things we can repent of. And those are the things we need to take seriously. That's the bad news for us. But if you do, and there are those who will do that, and when enough of those of us who do that, Greg, when enough of us do that, then the Lord will say, okay, now there is a sizable body of those who get it right and who are humbling themselves, who are becoming the humble followers of Christ, even though they're persecuted by others who are not the humble followers of Christ. As in the Book of Mormon, again, we have the same type there. Others in the church, right? Uh, and Isaiah says in chapter 66, those who are zealous for the word of God are persecuted by those who are not zealous for the word of God. And they're, ex they're ex you know, um, what's, he used the ex ex excluded or you know, this fellowship or whatever. Um, when that situation happens, at a certain point, the Lord says, enough. You guys have suffered enough from those who are doing the persecuting, and now I'm going to empower you. And that is the scenario in... In 1 Nephi, where Jesus, Nephi talks about the division that happens between those who repent and those who harden their hearts. And it happens at the time also when the great whore of all the earth is, is doing her thing, right? Just coming down upon the saints of the Lamb. Because the more saintly you, you become, as you find out from, the, from Jesus' doctrine, Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount, the more you will be persecuted in the end. And so when things come to a head and the righteous are becoming more and more righteous and the wicked are becoming more hardened, then all hell breaks loose. But that is the very time, according to the covenants that the Lord makes, which are the precious, plain and precious things were taken out of the gospel of the Lamb. According to the terms of the covenants, when, when those who keep the covenants with, with the Lord are persecuted, to where their lives are in danger, to that point, it goes all the way to that point, then the covenant curses that would normally come upon the, those who break the terms of the covenant come upon those who persecute them and attack them and endanger their lives. And that's when all hell breaks loose and the power of God descends upon the saints of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord, that's members of the church and the house of Israel, and empowers them against those who are persecuting and those who are doing the persecuting, believe me, they're from, mostly from within, not from without. That That's very clear from these scriptures. Yeah. Yeah, okay. There you have it, kind of in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What, so you, you talk about two different thing, ways that, that Isaiah speaks and prophesies. He, he speaks in a linear fashion on his prophecies, and then he speaks in a synchronous fashion in his prophecies. Will you explain the difference between those two? Because that I think is important as people delve into Isaiah to try and understand what he's saying. If we all think it's just, we would normally in our minds think of just that linear portion, right? What, right. what is the difference between the linear and the synchronous? Okay. So besides what you read on the surface of Isaiah's prophecies, you know, just the narrative or the, the poetry, the verses, the prophecies, and, and, and those have many, so many nuances, like, Parallel lines. What do they? What do they do? Well, they help you define terms and ideas. There are so many checks and balances in Isaiah. It's there's no excuse for you not to get it right, and you can you can check every which way whether something whether a conclusion you come to is correct or not from his literary evidences. But um, and when you have enough of those, you know when your typologies coincide with the rhetoric or the the word. You, the language, his use of words and terminology, and that coincides with, you know, the literary structures, 
the larger structures, then, then you know you're on the right track. So there are linear structures that create a timeline from Isaiah's day to the very end time, to the coming of the Lord, Jehovah, which is Jesus Christ in the flesh. And there, and there are layers of them. And each one has an amazing message. Go to my books and find them there. They're amazing in themselves. And that's in addition to what you're reading on the surface, those timelines. And they follow literary patterns from the ancient Near East, Egyptian patterns, Ugaritic patterns, Assyrian or Hittite patterns. Yeah, several ancient Near Eastern, that's why Nephi says, you know, I've, I've, I know about the, the regions round about. So he understands those literary patterns. I, I am sorry, I know about what? He's learned, he's, he knows about the regions round about Israel. Oh, okay. He's, he knows their literatures as well as his own, because they're all taught together in the Jewish schools. And then there is a synchronous, there are synchronous structures, one big one, the one was my doctoral dissertation, and then 10 more years of postdoctoral work after that on the same literary structure. It's so rich, it's so complete, it covers every single part of the book of Isaiah, and it transforms the entire book of Isaiah into one synchronistic end time scenario to where all the parts cohere as part of parts of an end time scenario. Even the historical parts that are just plainly historical then serve as some kind of allegory or type and shadow of what happens in the end time. The same as you have in the Book of Mormon, where historical things typify something that happens in the end time. And that's the Book of Isaiah. Those are the synchronous structures. There are other synchronous structures, like the 30 events that I talked about that repeat themselves in the end time. Okay, so what Isaiah does, he describes one of them, let's say the Exodus out of Babylon. And in connection with it, in the same context, he talks about the wandering in the wilderness. Like Israel came out of Egypt in Exodus, right? And they wandered in the wilderness 40 years. Well, the end, the end time Exodus is only just a few years, but and wilderness wandering. But then somewhere else, he'll take one or two of those things, the Exodus and the new wandering in the wilderness, and put them somewhere else and connect another event to it, like the conquest of the land under Joshua and make that a type for the end time. And so you, you're starting to see this happening over and over through the book of Isaiah, where two or three events are linked together, the same ones and different ones together, and, and you see they're all connecting like dominoes. So that in itself is a synchronous structure. You put all those dominoes together, and you've got a complete puzzle of these 30 events of the end time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it, it's genius. I mean, why don't people want to know that? <laughs> I don't know why they want to. I don't know why people don't want to know that. Yeah. Yeah. I well, I think that for a lot of people it's work and I don't know that they want to work for it. Honestly, I think yeah, it's yeah. the pro but the issue is, is like you're saying, you say that because you've done the work, Yes. but it's, I, you know, I, I at least have a, a flavor of learning spiritual aha moments and, and revelation that I've received just from searching the scriptures. I know it's worth it. I, you know, I know that it's, you know, I, I hope, I just wish that more people knew that, more people felt that, saw that. And, yes. and I'm not saying I'm any expert, I'm not, but... Uh, no, none of us are, yeah. But, but I've had some, I, I have had some aha moments and really had the Spirit speak to me on on revealed truths at times. And and I think that's the purpose of it. Um, so think, talking about how he writes, it's... Um, one, one more thing about... Sure, go ahead. <laughs> that's several years ago, not, not wanting to pay the price that is so important you know we want to inherit all that the father has right but are we willing to to sacrifice all things so that we might inherit all things of the father uh, satan wanted to be the savior of the world but he didn't want to pay the price he had an alternate plan That's we right. could skip out of paying the price and but jesus was willing to pay the price so we should emulate him go ahead sir i interrupted you craig yeah you're gonna say you know that, that, exactly that's the big difference i mean it's i i you know what i'm amazed at uh, Abraham is, is going through and it's becoming more and more evident uh, this uh, uh, the, 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 the valley between where we're going and how simple the truths are of say the Garden of Eden story. <laughs> it's like th those used to feel like well they're nothing that's of course you know yeah man may or God made man and woman and they were to multiply and replenish the earth and 
And uh, he had to, you know, when he, when there was a fall, he has, you know, you got to go work by the sweat of your brow and, and uh, you, you know, create families and, and teach your children. And, but now you look at the world, it's completely falling away from those very core basic truths that seem so simple right so simple yes. to your to yes. your understanding they're so becoming obvious. very yeah. nebulous mm-hmm. so yeah they've been thrown under the bus yeah they've been thrown under the bus now the way that isaiah is writing then is you know i mean your book is called isaiah decoded that's so, one of them so he's writing in a code so to speak based based on kind of what your title is he's writing somewhat in a code why does he do that it does it what are the reasons behind that? Um, why not just lay it out a little more <laughs> simply? Uh, is it because we're required to work for it? And, and that's the, the, you know, for us to be able to get to that point of, of, of a spiritual level, as you call them, a, a ladder and different levels on the rungs on the ladder. But is it because we've got to do that? You have to do the work to be able to understand it? Yes. There's no other way around it, Greg. There simply is not, but it's empowering when you do, and even when you do a little of it, baby steps, that is empowering too, because the spirit will testify to you that it's right, and and it'll egg you on to the next and to the next. And like I said, that's how spiritual progression is. Isaiah is layered, and that, Isaiah has layered his, layered his book with all of these levels and with all of these nuances that are hidden from the world. Uh, anyway, if it was revealed all at once, then people will be under condemnation for not living all of it. And that's too much. God doesn't want to condemn people. He wants to give them a chance to progress from one level to the next. So he gives it to them to them in layers. But they will only get those layers themselves. And that's that's how becoming a God is. It's in layers. And Isaiah, I've identified seven spiritual levels in the book of Isaiah just by the by the people, the characters who who wander around the book of Isaiah, you know, who, the, who are the main characters or, or the ones who are doing the, uh, who, are, who are fulfilling these end time events. There's seven different kinds of those people. And when you see what they do on their level, and you say, well, that, that kind of ties in with the perdition category and that ties in with the, it's very obvious what it ties in with, like Paul saw, one glory of the, the sun, the moon and the stars, three. Celestial, terrestrial, and celestial. So it is in Isaiah. And then there's the, the translated level. And then the Book of Mormon, you know, it contains the fullness of the gospel, but not, not in the written doctrine. It's in the lives of those who are exemplifying those translated categories of people. What is their backstory? How do they get to be translated? Well, because they were willing to pay the price, getting back to that idea. And Isaiah has all of that in there. And, and Lectures on Faith has all has that part of it in there yeah um, yeah the you know. doctrine of the doctrine yeah. of Lect- lecture six on the lectures on faith by joseph smith yes mm-hmm. yeah so uh, you know i i wonder sometimes if the way that that's written in isaiah well first of all let me ask you this and, and then i've got a last question um nephi talks about the learning of the jews in conjunction with isaiah and yet at the same time he loves Isaiah, but he wants to protect his children, it seems, from the learning of the Jews, in a way. So what is he saying there with that? How is he saying, you know, it seems that Isaiah writes according to the, the understanding of the Jews or the learning of the Jews, but, but he doesn't want to give the learning of the Jews to his kids. Yes, it was only had among righteous individuals such as Jacob. I can, I can get that. Yeah, his others. And he and Jacob also has things to say about that, right? The learning of the, because um, their their works were works of wickedness and so forth. And that is because of the code names and keywords and and and, and prophecies inside prophecies that Isaiah has hidden in his book. But he uses every single literary device that he can possibly can to communicate more truth. So, if you're a righteous person. And you, you latch on to the book of Isaiah. I want to know this. I'm willing to pay the price. I'm going to devote the next two years to X number of time per day, and I'm going to persist until I know it. And I promise you, if you follow the, the literary keys that I've provided, you will understand it completely. 
as far as as it's possible to understand at this point. Um, and so, those people who who are chosen to be kind of students can be indoctrinated with those things, but but not the masses as a whole, because what do they do? Well, they form secret combinations where they use code names of keywords and things like that, mm -hmm. right? And so those are expressly forbidden by Alma the Younger to his son Helaman to reveal from the plates of ether, right? The Jaredite plates, uh, because that, those things resulted in the destruction of the Jaredite nation and in the Nephite nation eventually. So, so wait a minute. So you're saying that in Isaiah, there are certain keywords that are used uh and but it can only be understood by righteous individuals because if those that are wicked have a hold of them they can actually in some way with that understanding uh uh, uh well i guess dissolve society well yes <laughs> yes that's a bit of a paradox because there's also prophecies that say all things will be revealed in the end time and and that is happening now all things are being revealed the worst kind of wickedness and the uh, and the greatest kind of righteousness will soon be revealed also as the lord's hand, as the lord starts intervening in our life, in the situation here before very long um so yes um they were not to teach those things necessarily about keywords just that's my opinion right i'm just mm -hmm. speculating that mm -hmm. everything else that i say i have proof of in the book of isaiah because i i have this motto that if you can't show it from the scriptures don't say it but so if I express my opinion, that's my opinion yeah. about possibly not teaching them the manner of the Jews because not not as a whole, but yes, among the among the scribes, among the the prophets, the, the schools of the prophets that they had, as well as the Old Testament times had, um, th those things were taught. That was the manner of the Jews that was taught in all its completeness. It was not withheld. Okay, so here's my last question: What what about the Jews and, and their understanding of Isaiah? Well, you're a Hebrew scholar. Um, you've studied these things closely. Um, they have their understanding of Isaiah, and a lot of it we would probably be able to learn from. But um, the Book of Mormon, I think, clarifies a lot of these things for us. Also, where are they in their understanding of Isaiah as, as compared to maybe where Nephi was? Um, and, and, you know, apart from the idea of a redeemer of the world, you know, because really I think there's a couple things there, right. That I, when we talk about the fullness of the gospel, actually the book of Mormon, in my mind, it has to do with Christ and his mission and then the Abrahamic covenant and how that plays out among the Jews and the Gentiles and, and everybody else. And, and so I, I see that the fullness of the gospel in the book of Mormon in, in, in that respect. But how do the Jews then see that? Because I don't think they have a belief of how the Jews and the Gentiles are the first and then the last and the last and then the first. And there's this covenantal type of relationship there. Um, how do they see Isaiah? Yeah, you might be surprised. Um, well, back to the back to the uh, basic principles of the gospel, which is what Jesus taught and Nephi taught. And the the fullness of the gospel being lived in the lives of those who are eventually translated. Um, that, is, that, is what, that is what I feel is going on. Yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ is huge, but to get you started, right? On the path to sanctification, first purification or forgiveness of sins, and then on retaining remission of sins, and then moving on to uh, the fullness of the gospel. Like in, in 2 Nephi 32, uh, feast on the words of Christ, for they will tell you all things what you should do. Uh, get the Holy Ghost, and then it will tell you all things what you should do. And then when Christ manifests himself to you, whenever that could be, in the end time or to you personally, anytime, he will tell you what to do. So there's a progression there from one to the other to the other, till eventually, you know, you can see God and, and he have not manifest himself to you. The Jews have this amazing understanding of Scripture. The main thing that I learned from them, which everybody in the church needs to learn, if they haven't already, and that is to give deference to the Word of God, 
and have this idea that says, what is this telling me? What is God saying through these words? What is he trying to tell me through the prophet here? Rather than say, oh yeah, I know about that. Um, this proves that I, what I believe and da da da. Well, I can use this to prove what I believe. Proof texting, the opposite of what Jews do. The Jews have this humble approach to the word of God. In spite of the fact that they study most of all the Mishnah and the Gemara, which are commentaries of the commentary and so forth, of the Torah, the first five books of the Law of Moses, the prophets are kind of secondary, a secondary study, Haftarah. Um, but they also understand those. I, like my rabbi said, the book of Isaiah was spoken to his day, four people in his day, and it was also a prophecy of the end time. And I asked him, well, how do you know that? He said, we have no proof, but it's a tradition among us. Well, I discovered that proof during my doctoral dissertation with that literary structure, the seven part Isaiah Bifit structure. That's the literary proof that transformed the entire book of Isaiah into the, to the end time. As for the Jews, what Nephi had over the Jews, so to speak, was that Nephi had a vision of the end from the beginning. <laughs> and Jews today don't. Their eyes are glued to the scripture, to um, <clears throat> the letter of prophecy, I call it, in contrast to the spirit of prophecy, which Nephi had, and which members of the church ought to have, and many do. Um, but you need to combine the letter of prophecy with the spirit of prophecy to get it right. And the, the Jews have never gotten it right about Jesus because he did not fit, fit the bill of the Latter-day David, the end time servant that Isaiah predicts and which Joseph Smith also comments on in, on page 339 of the uh, Teachings. Uh, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Yes, thank you. And others have spoken about it in the church and out of the church. So the Jews were fixated on the land of David, this temporal Messiah, the one who prepares the way for, this, for the coming of Jehovah or the second coming of Jesus Christ and didn't realize when they rejected Jesus that they didn't realize that Jehovah himself was coming, like Abinadi says, teaching the priests of King Noah, that Jehovah, God himself will come down and redeem his people from their sins. And for that, they burnt Abinadi you know, at the stake and so forth. And for that, they condemned Jesus, that he was making himself out to be the son of God. Yeah. And because that faction could get away with that in that day. Not all the Jews had that feeling. And the same day, in the, me, in the same way, as Brigham Young said, we're going to get it wrong in the end time, the same as the Jews got it wrong then, because we're expecting Jesus to come a second time and not expecting the servant because he's been hidden, as Isaiah says in chapter 49. He's been hidden and kept secret, specifically to be a test for the Latter-day Saints and the world in the end time. And that's coming right up. <laughs> I don't know when, I don't know, have a clue about who it is and so forth. I stay away from that subject as much as possible. But it's coming up and then you'll see fireworks <laughs> because they would not mar or disfigure such a person as Jesus mentions, quoting Isaiah 52 and 3rd Nephi 21, speaking of his servant in that end time scenario, not the time of Joseph Smith. Um, you know, they would not be doing that unless they had some real animosity toward that person. Avram, I really appreciate your time and going through this. Again, I think it's so important for us to understand Isaiah as best as possible. <clears throat> I, I, you know, I have noticed a little bit of a shift in the wind this year with a study of the Book of Mormon where there's there's a little more focus on Isaiah than there has been maybe well in a while, and uh, and so that's a positive and. And I hope that people will listen to this and then be inspired to, to study Isaiah a little bit more. So really appreciate you coming back on. You know, I've given a lot of bad news here today. I, I admit <laughs> that from Isaiah and from the Book of Mormon. But get into Isaiah. There's a whole chapter, I mean, a whole second half of the Book of Isaiah that's not quoted in the Book of Mormon, except in those 
chapters, if you get my, but from chapter 40 on, all the way to the end, there's so much good news there. And it's a beautiful scenario that Isaiah is painting. And, and you, you, we all deserve to know the, the, the bad first in order to incite us to repent. And then we deserve to know the good also and partake of the good that the Lord has planned for us. So, amen. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks, Abraham. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. <laughs>